that we have some uh, preliminary study using hyperspectral imaging and some class modeling approaches for honey authentication. Um, just so you know, honey is a very important natural product with many health benefits. Actually, it has a high dietary value and exclusive flavor, which makes it highly uh, with a high economical value as well and very prone to adulteration. In fact, um, in uh, the food fraud summary from the European Commission, honey is systematically among the most often adulterated food products and uh, usually for economical reasons, what we call uh, economically motivated adulterations, the EMA. EMA. Uh, so just so you know, um, this type of adulteration usually includes the substitution, dilution, simulation, or even mislabeling of uh, food products to obtain uh, any kind of a, a financial advantages. And this also impacts not only the economical sector, but also the, the food product, the food product quality, flavor, and uh, in some cases, the consumer's behavior towards specific products. Uh, and at last, but uh, more importantly, uh, it also have a huge impact uh, in the consumer's health because of the addition of sometimes toxic or uh, allergenic products. So honey uh, has a complex composition, although its major constituents is made, made of sugar, and, uh, but it also has uh, lots of proteins, minerals, organic acid, phenolic compounds, and vitamins. And different papers in the literature uh, use uh, different analytical techniques, such as molecular spectroscopy, chromatography, NMR, atomic absorption, and emission to uh, evaluate the and the chemical fingerprints of uh, specific honey products and uh, evaluate those, uh, those um, samples uh, regarding uh, botanical orange, geographical orange, or types of, of honey. So uh, those chemical composition uh, affects the color of the honey, uh, specifically the, the, the concentration of each one of those um, uh, those constituents that I mentioned earlier, and also it varies a lot with the botanical origin, geographical origin, uh, and also, the, and more important, the adulterants. Uh, usually syrups uh, systematically uh, added to honey samples, uh, like corn cane rice, uh, among others, and also sugars and colorants. And since the color is one of the, the first uh, aspects that we see when we are going to buy this type of, this type of product, we, are, we tried to use a fast and non-destructive method based in uh, hyperspectral imaging and visible and uh, NIR spectroscopy to evaluate if it's possible for us to um, uh, authenticate the honey samples uh, and, and discriminate it from the adulterated ones. So as the objective of this work, we want to assess food authenticity issues uh, by means of no, those non, this non-destructive analytical method and uh, evaluate the potential of hyperspectral imagery at uh, the visible NIR range using also pattern recognition methods to authenticate the, this, the honey samples that we are studying. This is to understand uh, the, me uh, the method ability to detect those different types of adulterants in different concentrations and move forward for uh, real life samples. As I told you, um, we, want, we are going to use simulated samples at this point to evaluate the method uh, in general. So we have one, what we call the control samples that are honey, authentic honey samples. And uh, we adulterated those samples, uh, increasing the concentration of glucose, caffeic acid, and sucrose in different proportion in comparison with the previous one, with the control samples. So we acquired some um, uh, hyperspectral images from these samples using these, um, this equipment here that's uh, the AFX-10 from Spessing, this hyperspectral imaging, at the range of 400 to 1,000 uh, nanometers. That's basically the visible range with a, a small portion of NIR. 
So to evaluate this data, all of this uh, massive amount of data, we have to first visual, of course, make a, a, a data visualization step to identify uh, which types of correction our data needed and pre-processing using some, some uh, uh, using standard normal variate and static collate to correct some additive effects and also some noise effects that we have, especially because we are talking about reflectance data. So we sometimes have uh, big issues with that. And um, one step forward, we use principal component analysis, not this past one, but uh, the, the, full, the full range of this, the, the spectra uh, to understand data variance and identify interesting features at this uh, exploratory point. But then we use some class modeling approaches such as SIMCA, soft modeling, independent class by, by class analogy and partial least squared uh, density model to authenticate the honey, the control honey samples. So you probably know by now, but uh, if someone is not uh, very aware for uh, food authentication, um, usually we have to focus on the target class that is our control class in the case, because this is the important class uh, in our case. So all, our models, it has, uh, we have to guarantee that the decision boundaries of our, our classification model will not change if we input some, some classes, for instance, that were not previously modeled and we cannot change this boundary uh, because um, what we want is classifying the, the, target, the target class, for instance. Also, it's important to remember that uh, the non-target samples, they, are not, they, not, uh, they do not necessarily compose a class because they might not have uh, characteristics in common, uh, chemically speaking. And then uh, that's why we are using class modeling approaches. Uh, to do this, we tried to, um, to compare for at this point of the, the, the research, a SIMCA and PLSTM. Uh, SIMCA, as uh, most of you uh, know, it's a PCA-based model. And uh, we basically, with the number of PCs that we define at the confidence level, we will define the, the shape uh, of the, our boundaries uh, in our class, in the, the target class. And uh, when we have an unknown projected samples uh, in the individual model, we can uh, assign this, uh, this sample to the class or not based on the, our residuals, usually the key residual or the T-Hopping square values. By PLSTM, uh, it's a different way of, uh, of defining these uh, this, uh, discrimination boundaries. And uh, we, because we use, we try to estimate the probability density distribution for each class, in, in, in our case, the control class, combining KNN, PLS, and um, potential function, function methods to estimate this density distribution. And uh, if for this case, we have to optimize uh, different parameters such as the number of neighbors that we need and the uh, smoothing coefficients to because it's going to be the parameters that will actually give us uh, the shape of these uh, these boundaries so just so you have an idea of the data that we have to deal with this is the mean the average uh, row spectra for each uh, class that we have, but also remember that we are talking about hyperspectral imaging. So we have a lot of uh, additive vari variability uh, that's related to uh, the different regions of our samples and also uh, related to light scattering from uh, the acquisition. And uh, although it's really hard to differentiate here uh, after the pre-processing and um, uh, of the pre-processing of our data, we can see that we have uh, specific regions, uh, spectral regions that we can actually identify uh, the maximum differences between uh, the, the spectra. These those are also average spectra of each one of the classes, especially here in the beginning of our spectral range that's usually related to riboflavin content in honey. And uh, this part here, that's a bit of uh, NIR, uh, that can be also related either to protein or sugars in some cases. And here, just so you have uh, an idea of the variability that we have to handle, 
Uh, here we have um, uh, 100 samples and we have different, uh, 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 different spatial aspects that uh, do the, the reflectance and light scattering in the, the light uh, in the, this translucent, translucent sample. And you can see that those are related to this uh, high uh, additive effect. But afterwards, when we preprocessing, we can see that uh, there are no there are no significant differences between the bottom, middle, and top part that are those here uh, in a PCA score scatter plot. So just so you know, just so you see, those are our samples here. We are um, um, the labels of the samples according the, with the type of adulterant and the, the concentration of each one. And here we can see the scar scatter plot of this image, the imaging that I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. But then this, the, this is a density plot in which those uh, uh, red spots here, it will show you how um, uh, there are many pixels with those specific score values uh, because we are talking about pixels of an, of an image. And here in this particular clus cluster here, it's related to the control sample that you can uh, see here. And uh, the other clusters are in general uh, related to the other samples around. But uh, we still have some spatial artifacts that we still have to, to, to deal with this uh, in the future. And also one important thing is that uh, although we can see the clusters in the density plot, in the density score scatter plot, it is possible to see here that uh, we have our overlap of uh, samples uh, from different classes in this uh, in this PCA, uh, the PC1 and PC2. So this already gives us an idea that uh, we might have some problems when if we, we make some classification techniques uh, with uh, Simca, for instance, and uh, that's actually what happened because when we analyze the data and we we uh, viewed the Simca model, we realized that uh, although we had a high true positive rate, we can also have a high false positive rate. And this is a problem because it means that the shape of our, uh, of our uh, boundaries, they are wide enough to include all the control samples, but they are also including many of the, the non-target samples. And this is a problem for us uh, regarding authentication of samples because it, it's a model that cannot uh, right now differentiate uh, control samples for uh, the adulterated ones. We can see here that um, there are many many pixels here that are uh, in this, uh, within the confidence limits for the SIMCA model. Uh, in comparison, we tried the PLSDM uh, just for testing our uh, control samples. And uh, after uh, trying to optimize those three, three parameters that we need, after building a few models, we can see that uh, we, we reach high values from specificity and sensitivity for those. And we choose the one with the best um, the compromise between specificity and sensitivity. And it was uh, a model involving uh, KN and RK2 uh, nearest neighborhoods. Uh, using Nauti scale for the PLSDM and also a smoothing coefficient of 0 0.4. This gave us a model in the, in the end with 87% uh, of class uh, sensitivity and 95% of class specificity, which is actually um, way better than uh, the SIMCA. But of course, this is uh, a preliminary study and we still have to make other trials, including uh, with SIMCA. Um, just uh, to conclude, um, the preliminary methodology that we are proposing here, it's found mm -hmm. promising for screening adulterated honey samples at this uh, day spectral range. And um, the results uh, can uh, show us that we can use simpler systems such as portable devices or cameras to authenticate honey samples. Also, PLSDM show potential to be investigated in the future. And uh, with that, I acknowledge my direct partners, mm -hmm. my project partners, also the AgroStat committee for the invitation and the audience for your time and attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>